everybody, and thank you very much indeed for having me again this year here at Finance Malta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the future of Europe. We're going to look at seven key areas. So we're going to look at a wide range of them, and then in particular, what we're going to do is then move over to the panel to, to discuss Brexit and also the other areas around which I'm go going to touch on. So what you see there behind me is what I call my CV in pictures. And the reason that I'm, I put that up there is I'm just going to give you a very brief summary of my business and then what I'm going to show you is the touch points in which it has with Europe. Because a lot of the time we think, oh, Europe, it's full, of, it's full of bureaucracy. And yes, we hear all about these millions and billions and even trillions of funding. But what could it do for somebody like me? Or then we often hear about, well, we have Horizon 2020, soon to be Horizon Europe. What has that got to do with me? Because surely it's only large companies get funding. So as you can see there behind me, I have a summer camp for teenagers focusing on careers, communication and confidence. And I'll show you how just yesterday I got a new opportunity for that in Europe. You'll see there that I also have a social enterprise enabling women to take more control of their financial freedom. Okay, there's another one. And in that particular case, I'm working on a completely new initiative that was only founded in Europe in 2016. And then you'll also see that I have a training company. And uh, in that training company, we started doing business over here in Malta in 2011. So that was when I was a one-woman band, and I had an ambition to look abroad. And then, again, Europe stepped in in some way. So from all of, the, from all of those points of view, that is where I'm going to talk about how Europe really is, is changing. Now, first and foremost, um, let's talk about probably one of the biggest changes of all, and that is, of course, that we have a new character in town. Monsieur Macron. And Monsieur Macron, since he has become part of Europe and become a very prominent figure, he's decided to put forward a range of new ideas. And I'll be discussing this with the panel. And one of them, for example, is this, the EMF, the European Monetary Fund. Now you might say, hold on, I thought it was the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Well, Monsieur Macron has other ideas. And this is back in 2010 when Ireland needed its bailout, that it wouldn't have gone to the IMF, that instead it would go to the EMF. And EMF then is being put forward as loans for reforms. And this is part of a wide range of what they're now calling a deeper fiscal integration in Europe. And when I'm in Malta and I put this idea forward, and I'd say, well, do you as Maltese want to be more involved in fiscal policy and having fiscal policy interwoven into Brussels? I get a muted response. But the thing is, is that that it looks like where it's going to go. And also, Monsieur Macron has put forward another couple of ideas, like a single Eurozone budget. That's different. And instead of having the president of the Eurogroup being an existing minister for finance, like the existing minister for finance from Portugal is, is that that would be replaced by a single Eurozone minister. That's different. So therefore, probably what you've often heard over the last couple of, of weeks and months is, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. Now, you know a lot more about that than I do in Ireland, I can tell you. But the point is clear, and that is that, well, we're all getting on now. None of us are in a bailout. Greece is out of a bailout. Ireland, we're the fastest growing economy in Europe now. We're all getting on well. Is now the time to work deeper and more fiscally together? And that is one of the areas where I'm personally watching very, very closely. This is another one, Enterprise Europe Network. Now, I cannot, for the life of me, understand why not far more of you know about this than already do. And I don't mean you in terms of a broadly Maltese audience, but I mean further afield. It's the largest business network in the world. There are 22,000 business opportunities on it, individual opportunities on it. And I won't tell you again this year how I benefited from it originally by coming out to Malta, but I will tell you a little bit of research I did. So what Enterprise Europe Network is about is connecting people together. It's about me having an Irish business, reaching out to you maybe as a distributor here in Malta. Or maybe it is that I, as an Irish business, would like to apply for European funding and I would like to connect with you, a university in Malta, in order to do so. That's what it's about. So I checked today and I checked how many Maltese businesses have gone on to Enterprise Europe Network to say they're available for business opportunities in Europe or that they're seeking connections in Europe? Guess what the answer is? 12. 12 Maltese businesses are currently on Enterprise Europe Network. 
And yet today, today's very theme, finance without frontiers. Well, we are going to talk about Brexit, so let's look at that frontier. What about if you wanted to work with a UK business and you wanted to do it easily, you want to find them easily, and then what you might do is you would go on to Enterprise Europe Network and you would see what UK companies are looking for funding partners or they have business requests or they have business opportunities. And the answer is there's 586 companies right now looking for you. And let's say you don't want to go that far. Let's, let's, let's not go that far at all. Let's not go to where Michael lives because then he might take the mic off us. Then let, let's not do that. Okay? Let's instead look at Italy. Why don't we just go as far as there? Let's go to Italy and see how many companies are available. 486 profiles right this minute. I checked it while I was sitting down there this morning. 486 companies today are looking for partners right around Europe to do business with. So therefore, it's there. It's there and it's growing and it's possible and there's lots of money behind it, etc. But more importantly, there's people. So that's the second area that I wanted to mention. The third is Horizon 2020. So Horizon 2020 is uh, the biggest, most ambitious uh, funding platform that there has been in the European Union to date. And just on the 2nd of May, so two weeks ago, two weeks ago, the European Union came forward and, and said, we are now introducing our next budget. It's the seven-year budget from 2021 to 2027. So now what they've done is that they have announced 100 billion euro to be invested into what's going to be called Horizon Europe. So again, I had a look and see what Malta did. So what did you do with Horizon 2020? What did you do, you, businesses in Malta, what did you do with the largest, most ambitious plan? And I'll tell you what you did. I'll tell you exactly. 106 organizations drew down 17.7 million. That's the statistics. And of those, 22 were SMEs, and they drew down 4.83. And I also looked at the success rate. So that's what worked. Let's see, well, what didn't? And the success rate in Malta was 13.5%. Was that high? Would you believe the success rate in every country is 136 So it was actually spot on. Malta is well able, well, 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 well able to punch at its own weight and even higher. So therefore, this is a big, new, ambitious, global, focused on Europe, pot of money, that if you talk to anyone in the US, they don't get this. I'm sure our US visitors today will say that. When I talk to my US clients, they say, hold on, there's 100 billion available to just be innovative. Really? Yeah. Oh, why? And I'd say, well, to go back to Karen, Kenneth Farouge's words this morning, it's because that is the way in which we can accelerate our industry. So no matter which one of the 21 countries that you come from today, that is our opportunity as SMEs, is to pursue that and to pursue it forward. So I just want to briefly touch back on my summer camp for teenagers, because also on the 2nd of May, there was another announcement made, and that is that there is a doubling, that's right, multiplied by two, a doubling of the Erasmus Plus budget to 30 billion over that period of time. That's billion with a B now. So I had a look at this anyway, and Erasmus Plus is all about lifelong learning. So no matter what age we are, from the cradle to the grave, Erasmus Plus is supposed to enable us to do something. But again, is this just full of red tape and just really a small number of people get at it anyway? So I had a look at this, and uh, yesterday I came across what was a youth work digital skills study trip to Helsinki. It's available for 40 people. Every single thing is funded. So I decided to look into it further because ultimately, in order for us to bring more digital experiences to my teenagers, then I'm going to have to be aware of what's going on. So I did, and I went on that, and then I saw that there were 40 spaces available. All country, all member states can go on this. It's, four, it's four, four nights, five days, and it's totally focused on experiences, etc. Won't cost me anything, and it took me 10 minutes to apply for it. And then what I also did was that I rang my national, con uh, my national contact point to make sure that the application got received. I will know by the end of June if I'm approved to go. That was it. The bureaucracy was tiny. In fact, if it was any lower, it, w it, it wouldn't have been right. So therefore, all of these things are available. And then I also thought about, okay, I told you about my social enterprise. And I was listening earlier to, uh, to, the, to the blockchain panel about financial inclusion. And then I came across this, the European Solidarity Corps. And the European Solidarity Corps to, works with people who are between 17 and 30 because they have a key challenge in, in terms of employability that they don't have enough experience, etc. 
So they, only in 20, December 2016, so yes, I know we can, be, we can say that Brussels moves slowly. Well, maybe not in this case. So in just in December 2016, the European Solidarity Fund was established, which was a volunteering portal for people between 17 to, to 30 to volunteer on projects of any nature. They could be social, they could be demographic, they could be geographic, they could be earthquakes, you name it. And it's designed to enable those people to have a paid method to build their skills as well as to engage Europe closer together. So I applied for this as well and I said, well, on my social enterprise, can I apply for somebody anywhere around the EU to come and work in, in the social enterprise? They said, yes, you can. Just fill out this form. And again, that was the same phone call as the one yesterday, whereby I said I was applying for the social visit. By the way, that European Solidarity Corps, that funding has been doubled also. And then I looked into how many people from Malta were on that. And yet again, I saw that it was actually down to double digits. That's all. And you can imagine who's highest. Spain, Germany, and then the UK. Now, yes, they have, certainly, they have plenty of population to back that up. But the key point is, again, this is where the money in, Bel in Brussels is going. And then we have Brexit. So, I was sitting, as I say, right down there. I've been down there all day. Right down there, I've been having the top spot. And then I saw Michael's paper, namely the Financial Times, sent me an alert. They didn't send it just to me. They sent it to all of their database. And the reason I got an alert is because three hours ago, just three hours ago, and I did not know this at the lunch break, never mind the last coffee break. There's been a key development in Brexit in that the UK government is now deciding that in order to avoid a hard border in Ireland, that what it's now deciding is to look maybe more towards staying in the customs union or having some sort of a customs partnership rather than having a border across the Irish Sea. That changes everything. And because three hours before that, my Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, is over at the Balkan States at the moment and put forward the view that absolutely no way will the withdrawal bill be decided between the UK and the EU without an agreement on the border. So therefore, Brexit is having a very, 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 is having a hard time dealing with 500 miles across the Irish island. And we'll talk about that an awful lot more when we move on to that area with the panel. And the last two I wanted to talk about, um, the first one is VAT. VAT, as you know, value-added tax, it's, uh, it's worth 7% of EU GDP. That's how much is collected, 7%. 7 so it's, it's a very substantial amount of money. And uh, the key issue with VAT is that most of us obviously spend it, and we spend it in locations that are close by, and therefore the administra administration is very easy. The issue is, though, is that when you are online, so I can only sell to you, as an Irish business online, these are called distance selling rules, I can only sell to you up to €35,000 before then I have to register here for VAT, even though I don't have a presence here, I'd have to register here for VAT and fill out VAT returns, and then, of course, I have to go along with all of the other administration that goes with it. So you know what? I don't bother. I don't bother going above 35000 and neither does most other people. By the way, it's the same the other way around. We're at 35,000 as well. The Netherlands is 100,000. The UK is 70,000 pounds. So therefore, that, this brings us right back to where Helen was this morning when she was, talk, or, uh, when she was talking about the issue around the digital market. So therefore, if there are issues like that preventing me selling to you and you selling to me, and Karen, or, uh, or sorry, Helen said to us this morning, that only one in five companies are highly digitized. She said that only 40% of the EU workforce needs to be dramatically upskilled, but yet this was holding it back. So it was only last December, there's been a major simplification of the VAT rules, which means that up to 2 million of turnover, and specifically 85,000 of turnover in any one country, the, the, VAT, the simplification around VAT will be extended dramatically right across the European Union. And that's definitely one to watch. And the very last thing I wanted to mention is this, is that last December, uh, the EU signed, uh, sorry, put forward the text for the Economic Partnership Agreement with Japan. And that was part particularly significant because that will dramatically lower the trade barriers and the tariffs involved with third country trade in, in Japan. And it was just on the 18th of April, the text was finalized to be presented to council. Last September, CETA was, all, was, was implemented to, um, in, in principle 
CETA is the Canadian European Trade Agreement. And of course, we all know that a lot is happening around U US EU trade. I won't bring up the contentious TTIP because that brings about its own connotations. But the key thing I'm trying to say here is that as the world is deepening and widening in terms of trade, and similarly, while we're seeing moves towards populism and protectionism, this is certainly one area where we certainly, certainly need to watch. And just so that I can bring this right around in full circle before we sit and talk to the panel, I just want to mention to you one last thing about Enterprise Europe Network. Is that no less, no less than 50 events happened in May for Enterprise Europe Network. No less than that, 50 events happened in May all over Europe, doing like I said to you earlier, connecting businesses with individual, individual opportunities. And only for my husband, uh, my husband's friend had a wedding on the 10th of May, I would have been pursuing one of them. And one of them was, ironically, that the Enterprise Europe Network were offering businesses of all sorts free, that's F-R-E-E, -E, no cost whatsoever, free exhibition space at the largest tech festival. Where? In Japan. So therefore, this is the point I want to make to you, is that Europe is indeed full of opportunities. The thing is, though, is that we have to go and grasp them, and that is the future of Europe. So, before I start over here and I, I talk to my, uh, my panellists, could I ask you please to all take two minutes as we're talking to think about one key area where you would like to move forward in. So maybe it is engaging with the National Solidarity Corps or Ma European Solidarity Corps, or maybe it is looking further into the VAT rules and how that will change distance selling. Or maybe it is applying for one of the digital hubs that, uh, that Helen mentioned earlier on today. Or maybe it is that you want to do something like looking at the Japanese or the Chinese markets with Enterprise Europe Network's help. Or maybe you need to in engage in lifelong learning through Erasmus Plus. Or maybe any one of the other things that we mentioned over the past throughout the day and through throughout my last 15 minutes please do make sure and take the time to think about what you're going to do to engage in the future of Europe so I have a galaxy of stars here behind beside me um, I have a range of experience uh, we go from London to Brussels to Malta to Gozo, I won't forget Gozo, David, don't worry. Uh, so we, we have, we've, we've qu quite a range here. So what I would like to do first is that I'm, I'm very aware of, of the, the breadth of issues that we could discuss, but I do particularly want to pick up on Brexit because A, it's a big area, and B, I wanted to give it a minimal exposure in mind so that you could hear from a Maltese perspective. Um, so I think maybe if we, if we start off with you, maybe, Alfred, would you like to, uh, to, to talk to us a little bit about Brexit, particularly since, in your case, you prepared the country for EU membership, you prepared the country for EMU membership, then you went through all the crises, and I know us Irish caused you a little bit of bother, sorry about that, we didn't mean that at the time. Um, and now, as you look to Brexit, what views would you like to share? Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for this invitation for this uh, um, panel discussion. Um, as you rightf rightfully said, basically, I've been exposed um, in the last, essentially in the last, um, I would say, 20 years um, for the, um, basically for European Union membership and then Euro area membership and then we've been through the crisis and I've seen all the dynamics of the uh, crisis play out, essentially. And of course now we are um, uh, um, not directly but indirectly involved because as you uh, will, will, uh, will appreciate uh, when it comes to the negotiations, the negotiations uh, on Brexit are being carried out um, by a central team. Um, of course with the involvement of the member states, but essentially it's a central team and it's a unified approach when it comes to these discussions. Um, I would say, I would tend to think that when it comes to Brexit, um, there are different issues which uh, would obviously um, uh, need to be looked at from a European perspective. And of course there would be in the national perspective. Essentially, when it comes to the European perspective, there is certainly uh, the kind of arrangements that need to be had with an ex-European Union member state. This is the first experience. Um, um, it's something which we've never experienced. Essentially, if you, if you go back um, at the time of the crisis, there were also a, a number of firsts there, essentially. We've had um, the crisis playing out, then we've had a number of bailouts, essentially, 
um, um, the countries that were involved were Euro area member states. Um, uh, the very existence of the Euro area was um, uh, at a certain point of time um, uh, basically at risk. So uh, radical action needed to be taken then and it was taken in order to stabilize the situation. The challenge of Brexit is, I would say, not an easy challenge in its own right, definitely from, an, from a new perspective. And essentially, I could see the dynamics uh, change um, when we were approaching the UK referendum. First it was a shock, then it was disbelief, then it was a question of basically um, um, almost, almost uh, one would not accept that it's going to happen. Now it's a question of acceptance. And I think that um, now acceptance has crept in. There are not too many doubts that basically Brexit is Brexit and Brexit will happen. And um, um, essentially there is, uh, I would say, acceptance, resignation, that that is something that will come to pass. And of course that has instilled, I would say, in the, in the, in the negotiations, some much needed realism, even when it comes to the kind of ne negotiations and to the contents of negotiations. And um, let Can I me ask you to elaborate on the realism? I would, I would elaborate. I mean, um, if you um, essentially look, we're, we're talking, uh, you know, in a conference organized by Finance Malta, we're talking, you know, in a context of financial services. And if you look at the way um, we've dealt with financial services at the European level, essentially, um, if you look at uh, the way uh, the thinking has changed in a couple of months. December, to December 2017, it was a question of uh, basically definitely no access to the single market. Or um, then by March, by March we've had a little change, but quite a significant change. Um, let's discuss um, any possible access under what conditions. Okay, in the context of a free trade agreement, perhaps, but let's discuss. And we're expecting definitely from the British side um, a significant, what they call a significant white paper, which should outline the British position. And I would tend to think that um, somehow, some, some kind of arrangements, there is this, real, this realization that, for example, when it comes to London, London is London, I mean, um, they're hosting a world-class uh, financial services sector. Um, the, the myth that somehow if you raise barriers, if you close, if you build walls around London, then London is going to get dismantled and everybody is going to move out of London and, uh, and, uh, and go somewhere else is a myth, in my opinion. Uh, definitely that is, that is part of, you know, uh, I would say, I would say, it's a myth that has been peddled around for so long, and even today, if you get the news today, basically, okay, London is on the wane. Well, I would tend to think that, you know, they've got such a huge comparative, exam uh, comparative advantage in the world economy, basically. They've got such a big ecosystem around, built around London. They've got, they've got all that it takes in London that it's going to be extremely difficult even with, 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 with walls around London, essentially, to get, you know, to get uh, London somehow dismantled. So let's, let's be realistic. And I think there is this realization sinking in that London is going to remain a world-class financial services center. And it will still keep on, keep, on, keep on operating independently of whatever we do. So basically, there is this realization now that in the context of a free trade agreement, Basically, we need to take to, to factor in to factor in services, and specifically, and there was this acceptance in the guidance that was that was accepted um, in the March European Council. Acceptance that yes, we need to discuss financial services, and of course, the kind of regulatory regulatory treatment that this would be given. But somehow, um, there could be some kind of arrangement for access to the single market of course, under certain conditions. Now, that is from a European perspective. From a national perspective, of course, um, we have to discuss um, our own position. 
um, definitely uh, we do engage with our stakeholders because um, that's extremely important. And I would tend to think that when it comes to um, this specific area, the most important is the regulatory framework um, that, would, that would be put in place in order to address, address uh, any form of excess, essentially. And of course, we need to look at taxation, we, look, we need to look at state aid issues, because all these need to be factored in, 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 into, into, into the kind of discussions. So that is something that we've put across, uh, basically, at European level, in order to be factored in, in the kind of discussions that will be undertaken in this area. So but I'm there is this kind of realization. So, if I could summarize that, in essence you're saying that there is a kind of an arrangement that needs to be adopted in the EU and that there needs to be a sense of realism um, on the part of the EU side as well, that, that London isn't going to go away. Speaking of the city, um, Hugh Anita, you were, you were there quite recently and, and you were specifically dealing with a lot of people in financial services, um, but very local people, you were there representing Malta, but could you, could you share insights about what the City of London are saying about Brexit at the moment? So, um, yeah, so thank you to Finance Malta because they recently sent me to, uh, uh, to represent Finance Malta on a panel during City Week in London and it was an exhilarating experience um, to see, you know, how the city is looking at it. Obviously, uh, the focus was on financial services being led by, by, by the city. This was during City Week. Um, very high caliber um, speakers, so people like uh, David Davis and Liam Fox and Inga Beale from Lloyd, so a hugely interesting lineup. Um, I, I, you know, I'd like to put also what I'm going to say in context. This was held in the Guild Hall, and I don't know if anybody in this room has ever been to the Guild Hall, but first of all, it, it's, it's an awesome. I mean, you walk in and you say, oh my God, it's one of those type of places, it's beautiful. Uh, and you have statues of, of Wellington and, and, and other um, important figures in, in UK history there. And I, the message that, I, th I think it was chosen with a purpose because the message from the speakers was very upbeat. Um, so the message was, let us not wallow in the negativity of Brexit but look forward to this with confidence. And pointing to Wellington, they said, you know, we stand on the shoulders of great men. We've uh, gone through adversity and come out trumps, and we're going to come out trumps this time as well. And that was the underlying theme of a lot of what they said. And, and the message was very strong and very positive throughout. So things like, no other city can aspire to be as big as London. It's going to be impossible um, for anybody to replicate the infrastructure that we have in London in any other city with the best of intentions, be it Paris, be it Frankfurt, you know, big cities. So this was very much the mood. And then when you, when you go to the MIFID session, you know, which was held just a few minutes ago, and, and the speaker there said, you know, an, a, an important directive like MIFID II was never, ever written um, considering that its largest player, the largest player in Europe, would be moving outside the EU. So, you know, this gives you the complexity of, of what we are about, about to face. Um, so, yeah, the message, as I said, was, uh, was, was very positive. Clearly, London has established itself, the UK has established itself as a very much an innovator in the fintech space, and that is a space they want to grow. Uh, they're looking not only at that space, but also uh, Islamic finance, which is, again, London has been at the forefront within Europe in that space as well, as well as green finance. So there are big ideas going through. Um, with regards to the relationship with the EU, um, there was some discontent at that point in time, so this happened about a month ago, that the EU was not understanding exactly what Britain wanted to get out of Brexit. Uh, and in particular, that uh, you know, the message was a good deal for the UK would be a deal on financial services. It's so important to them. Um, uh, and uh, essentially, we were, you know, what was being discussed was that equivalence, as we understand it within an EU context, won't cut it. So they were talking about different things. So like things like 
improved equivalence or enhanced equivalence, terms that I had never heard of before, and things like mutual access to markets. It's important that we have mutual access to markets because the EU needs us as much as we need them. So very much this, uh, this concept. There was also some discussion about um, a concept of delegation back to London and, and to, to, to UK. Um, so, you know, if services are pushed out to other member states, how much can be delegated back to London? And that was part of the discussion that they, they wanted to have um, with the EU. And an interesting point, I mean, we keep talking about London, but one of the things that came up, which to me was really striking, was that two-thirds of financial services in the UK is done outside London. And I remember Helena Morrissey actually saying this, and she said, it's important that post-Brexit, we're going to push financial services outside of London to reflect the vote on Brexit. And I thought that was so meaningful. So the idea is push financial services outside of London to make sure that the people who voted for Brexit know what this is all about. Um, so ve some very interesting messages. And then obviously there was an international dimension. Uh, and the international dimension is uh, clearly it was, it was a platform where the UK was showcasing its potential uh, to attract beyond the EU, business beyond the EU. So in a sense, you know, so to speak, wooing countries like India, uh, Japan, um, the US, um, and there were quite a few speakers also from, from, from these countries. So definitely looking beyond uh, the, the, the borders of the EU. And another thing that they said was it's important that we make sure as the UK we are sitting on all the international standard setting bodies to be able to influence and direct. Uh, we may lose the seat across the, the EU table, but we want to take it to a different level, which is, which is the, 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 the global platform, essentially. So um, all in all, I think the message that came out of there, now whether that is being actually felt uh, you know, at the coalface, at the, at the firms working within the city, that is obviously uh, not something that, that uh, we, we could have a handle on, but what came through during the, the, these two days at City Week was that the UK is going to make a success out of this. It'll be interesting to see. Um, and David, you spend much of your time in, in Brussels. Obviously, you're in the opposition party here in, here in Malta, so you're, you're hopping across islands um, on, on ma many occasions. Um, while Juanita d d described the, the she described the, the temperature in London, um, what is it like currently in Brussels? Oh well, first of all, thanks for having me. Thanks to Finance Malta. Um, well, I think Malta should do its bit to help Britain find it, its place in the world post Brexit, um, and I share many of the views. Uh, of uh, Alfred and Juanita. But you're asking me about the mood in Brussels, which is completely different than that of Malta and London. Um, it's really different because um, basically, I think the EU digested Brexit almost a year ago. And at the moment, uh, Brexit is not at the top of their mind. Uh, at the moment, they're trying to digest the new Italian government and uh, Trump's uh, walking away from the Iran deal or Trump's threat on uh, uh, imposing actually uh, tariffs on imports from the EU of aluminum and steel. So the EU is not at this point in time, in the here and now, thinking about Brexit, it's mostly thinking about President Trump and the new Italian government, because of course they want to change the rules, the growth and stability rules, basically the rules governing the euro currency. So the EU does not really um, keep tabs on Brexit, because they trust, they fully trust their chief negotiator, uh, Michel Barnier, and they as Alfred said, the EU is united, really united behind Michel Barnier, and sort of their wait, the, the, it's a wait and see game for them because they're waiting for the white paper of Prime Minister Theresa May. She said that 
she's going to announce this in June, and they're surprised that it's taking so long for the British government to decide exactly its future trade agreement with the EU. So the EU is uh, uh, mostly uh, surprised that the government, the UK government, took so long to decide its future trade relationship with the EU, and uh, it's steadfastly behind its uh, chief negotiator. Um, as far as the Irish uh, border is concerned, because this is uh, the thorniest issues of, of, of them all, um, the EU um, takes, um, gives weight, I would say, more to Dublin than to London, because it takes the view that um, Dublin is still in the EU, it's part of the, of the club, whereas the UK now is being treated by the EU as a third country, as a non-EU, especially in this context of Brexit. Of course, in other areas, uh, the UK is still part of the EU, like for example on security. But when it comes to Brexit, the UK is on the other side of the table. And that means that uh, Michel Barnier, uh, in, he, in, in his position, in the way he speaks, they always reflect the, the Republic of Ireland's view rather than the UK government. And I think um, that's only fair uh, because at the end of the day, um, the UK now is in the process of leaving. But still, the EU respects not just the decision of the British people, but it respects the UK government. And the EU wants, clearly wants, that this is going to be an orderly uh, Brexit. That's very important. So the EU wants Brexit to work for Britain, for Ireland, and for the, uh, the rest of the EU. But it's, of course, taking a, a quite a hard, tough stance in these negotiations. Um, I'll, I'll share my own reflections on that at the end if we've time, just because uh, you've, you've said a lot there, and particularly when, you, when we pick up on the, on the issue around the border. And I'll, I'm very happy to talk to you about what it's like in Dublin at the moment around that subject and our relationship um, with, with Michel Barnier. Before I do, um, I, I want to move on to my next question, but can I please ask you to put your hands in the air for any of you who do want to get to the roving mics. Lindsay is over there on the left-hand side. It's a big room and she flies around, but still we just need to have time to, to get to there. So can I ask you to please put your hand up and try to catch our eye before, um, before we, we get to the end of the next question. Um, Joseph, you're the father of this organization. Um, you're the man that set up Finance Malta. Uh, you're the man that set up f um, in, um, Malta Enterprise, etc. And you're currently on the, the government's task force on Brexit, and you're based in London. Um, we've heard the London view. We've heard the, uh, the Brussels view. We've heard the European and the national view. So what space is left here? What do we need to be considerate of that we haven't already discussed? Well. Um to start with, I'd like to actually thank Finance Malta for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, as such, we, we haven't actually called it a Brexit task force. We've actually called it a Malta UK business promotion task force. And the reason for this is that we're actually trying to identify problems that um, certain companies are likely to have as a result of Brexit and to talk about co-location. So we're trying to do it in a different stance. Um, I think until November, I think it was considered that Brexit wasn't going to happen. But obviously now Brexit is going to happen. I think what's happening in London is you've, had, uh, you've got a lot of uh, the French and Italians who've actually gone back to their country. So whilst the financial service sector in the UK or London represents 50% of all financial services within the current EU, um, I think that obviously London is still going to remain as the leading financial service sector in the world. In fact, although they have actually lost a number of jobs, uh, probably quite large numbers, 20 to 50,000 probably in the last few months, um, but I was actually talking to um, quite a senior man who is involved with the City UK. He's also chairman of a big uh, multinational company. And they're convinced that they're going to come out right out of the South situation. London is what it is. It is a great place. That's where people want to be. 
and as such, I think, whilst they might have certain problems, um, let's say over a year or two, I think London would actually come back and be a strong point. But what about the rest of the UK? I mean, you know, financial services is 10 to 12 percent of their GDP. It represents 10 percent of their tax base. I mean, 50,000 jobs is 5 percent of the workforce of people that work in that industry. And I know that because I know where the jobs are going. Well, I know that um, Ireland, obviously, we're trying to get or create some 60,000 new jobs uh, as a result of Brexit. Whether that's actually happening or not, I don't know. Um, obviously, I think what's happened is that certain, certainly the French and the Italians, who were very much involved in the financial service sector, have actually gone back. Now, whether one can actually get them back into the UK, um, obviously, there is a problem about freedom of movement of people, so that's um, a particular problem. Um, admittedly, a lot of people are, are getting people that have been in the UK for more than five years are obviously trying to get British citizenship. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that the UK will somehow come out of it. I mean, and, and, and have you spoken to people in Birmingham or Nottingham or Belfast or Cardiff or Edinburgh or Glasgow? I personally haven't. Um, I, I sort of tend to meet people in London, really. Yeah. Um, I have actually met up with the CEO of the City UK, Miles Selig, and there's also Bob Wigley, who's um, chairman of uh, UK Finance. Um, there are, uh, as I said, there, there is a particular person who actually was quite confident that the UK will pull out of the whole thing whilst Brexit takes place. Okay, that's an interesting point. Just walk away, leave it all there, Ryanair can't touch down, and we're defaulting to WTO rules. Is that what that person is saying? I don't know. Um, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Because that, that, I have to say, is the temperature of where it's at in Ireland at the moment, is that there's a dramatic fear of what you've just said could very much happen. True. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what Brexit really entails. So there's this uncertainty as to what's going to happen. So you've got certain large companies that have actually taken decisions and moved on to another your jurisdiction. But let's say the smaller companies haven't. They can't afford to anyway. Sorry? They can't afford to. No. I, I, I personally think that they're just waiting to try and actually find out exactly what it actually entails. I'll be looking forward to figuring that out myself. Um, thank you very much indeed for that, Joseph. And now, uh, Lindsay, has there, have there been any questions? Surely there's at least one on Brexit from this audience. It looks like you've all done a remarkable job of covering the whole thing. Great. Well, just now, if we could, could move on and look at other areas um, of, of, of what's going on in, in Europe. And, and on this note, if I could, um, David, I'm ju just, going to, just going to come back to you on, on one point, and that is that I am very well aware, uh, exceptionally well aware of, of from travelling here as often as I have, how important Gozo is. But we haven't discussed that yet today. And what I'd like to hear is, the Horizon um, 2020, sorry, Horizon Europe and all of the, the long-term budget that has been agreed and only announced a month ago, it's up to 1.1 trillion, um, which is a, an exceptionally large amount of money and obviously dedicated to research and development. How is Gozo going to get a piece of that? Or, or where do you see a vision for Gozo being? Um, it could very well be the vision for Malta, I guess. Um, you mentioned Erasmus. Uh, during your presentation at the beginning of this uh, discussion. Uh, well, Erasmus, I think, is the most or one of the most um, successful programs of the European Union. And uh, it is uh, successful because I think most um, uh, students and youth, I, I am myself a former Erasmus student, I think most of us think that um, Erasmus was the first experience we had outside our country and we feel that it was our first uh, um, experience of um, broadening our mindset. You tend to meet people from other countries so you tend to understand other cultures, other mindsets. It improves your inter uh, uh, cultural skills, civic skills, uh, social skills. Um, it's, it's just wonderful. You know after I was brought, as you, brought up, as you say, in Gozo. So my window to the world was, the, at the time, it was just the Italian TV. That we, we, of course, we didn't have internet at the time. So um, I used to think that Europe 
is um, uh, more or less like the, Europe, the Italian culture, which is not the case, of course. So it was just wonderful for me in Milan. I spent six, uh, six months there. So it was just wonderful meeting Spanish. Um, I realized, actually, that the, the, the southern part of Spain, we share so much with them in terms of culture, from Alicante, remember? But also Danish and Germans. And I, I, you know, at the time I could see that we have our distinct, also our distinct culture. So uh, Erasmus was great because it helped me realize that this European project, this European Union project, is just wonderful. It brings people together um, and it helps us understand each other better. And it helped me understand why open trade, I had studied it at university, so it, it helped me understand why opening up to trade it's such a wonderful idea. And I get that, and that's wonderful, but I'm specifically wondering about the vision for Gozo in particular, yes. because I'm, I'm, I'm watching the clock here as well, and I just would like to hear who's, yes. who's looking out for them. And you mentioned research and development funds, so the EU now, with the seven-year budget, is going to increase uh, the research and, develop, uh, research and innovation fund by 30%. Erasmus is going to be... Uh, doubled. There's going to be a massive increase on uh, m business projects in Africa, mostly dissuading, trying to dissuade people from leaving Africa to Europe. So all these EU funds mean that uh, Malta can benefit from them because it can become a hub using these EU funds it can become, and Gozo as well, it can become a hub of uh, exchange programs of education training for people coming from North Africa, um, Africa, for people coming from the Middle East. Malta can become a hub not just on education and training or exchange of students, but also on innovation because we've, we have, we, we, we're seeing so much funds coming our, our way on research and innovation. And here we are uh, Malta. Uh, which is basically the birthplace of Edward de Bono, the lateral and creative thinker. So Malta can become, and Gozo can become, a link between the EU and Africa, European states and African states. Malta can become a link between uh, Britain and the Arab world, because Malta has extensive links with the Arab world. And that's basically uh, my vision. It's got all the ingredients except political will. After all, it's about willpower, it's about political will. So we, we as stakeholders in this country, we can sit down around the table and work it out in reverse. We say, okay, we agree on this, let's take ownership of this idea and let's see how we can get there together. And when we take ownership of things and, and we try to, to get there together, pr particularly when, when we work in cohesion to get there, we can achieve great things. And one could argue, Hugh Anita, that that's exactly what has been going on in the European Union, specifically around financial services. And all day we've been listening to reg tech and regulation, and whether it's MIFID II or GDPR, we've listened to a range of that. Do you feel that the last 10 years, because uh, we're now at the 10th anniversary of the crisis, uh, do you feel that banking resolution and, and all the efforts that have gone into building that system back up again, psychologically, as well as technically, as well as from a regulation point of view, has that been achieved um, in the past 10 years? It's worth... Uh, so, oh, uh, no, I just put this to a Juanita. Thanks, David. Um, okay, it, it, it's a difficult question to <laughs> answer in just four minutes. Um, uh, yeah, but, uh, I mean, obviously we all know that as a result of the crisis, we had this... Uh, banking union that went into overdrive creating all these rules i mean banks if there are any bankers in the room know what hell they've been through and are still going through with uh, new requirements new reports so i cap i lap resolution plans recovery plans so um i think you know they 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 literally have just gone from one thing to the next so the question is, is this going to avoid another crisis? And together with that is the next question is, should banks be allowed to fail? And I am one of the <laughs> clear proponents that, yes, banks should be allowed to fail because the taxpayer, um, uh, you know, sort of, the, the, the only thing is it needs to be a managed, uh, a managed failure. So we cannot, this is part of the, you know, the caveat emptor, if, if, you are, if you are putting your money somewhere in an institution, then yes, there is a risk that that institution can go belly up, and you can't expect the government of the day to shore it up just because, you know, there are so many 
depositors in the country uh, involved. And what we're hoping is that with all this raft of new regulation, um, major crisis of the sort that we saw in Northern Rock, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, I mean, things like these won't, won't happen again. Um, it's a bit too early in the day to say whether the objective has been achieved. I mean, we saw the resolution of Banco Popular where the ECB just moved in and, and sold it off to Santander for one euro. And that, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as it was about to fail. And this morning we heard that the interventionist powers that the ECB has is that it moves in before an institution fails, which is something that before we didn't have. And now, we're, we, we, as we heard this morning, we're, we're probably moving along the lines where the ESAs, the other ESAs, ESMA, IOPA, EBA are going to, you know, probably have these sort of powers. But as I said before, I mean, Banco Popular wasn't one of the major institutions across Europe. I mean, obviously within Spain, it, it did have some effect, but not, not to a large degree. Um, will whatever rules and regulations have been put in place be able to uh, avoid another Lehman's? Uh, it's a bit too early in the day to say, but the only thing is that, you know, sort of even wearing uh, my XKPMG hat, I think one of the things that, um, uh, that this has done, all this raft of regulation, is to make banks focus on the key areas where they could have problems before they were being glossed over. But now you've got the board of directors that needs to sign off on their capital adequacy, needs to look at their liquidity and whether they can, they have to actually stress their liquidity and say, in a situation of a liquidity crisis, I need to think now what I would do, not wait for it to happen, which is what happened before. And, so, and I'm, I'm so, sorry to cut you off now, but mm -hmm. I do ju just, just want to give, to give the, the, the closing words on this to Alfred, and that is, that Juanita there is talking about individual banks looking at their balance sheets, looking at their areas of, of vulnerability. And if I could, Alfred, I'd, I'd just like for you to comment on the area that I started off on, um, which is that very phrase that the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. And could you maybe give us a view of where, where conversations around this at a European level about deeper fiscal integration are going? Because as I mentioned, this is of particular concern here in Malta. Okay. Um, um I think we first need to understand what fixing the roof is all about because um, evidently once you've got a roof with multiple holes, with multiple areas where it could leak, then of course um, we need to look um, um, at the roof in a very wide perspective. So um, Juanita was talking about banking union. Um, let me put it this way, banking union still works in progress. Um, if you look at uh, the kind of regulation that has been put in place, it's there, it's fine, but um, um, surely it has never as yet been tested in, a, in, 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 a, in an extreme scenario, in a, in a stressful scenario. Um, if you look at, for example, uh, liquidity support, when it comes to liquidity support, when it comes to, to resolution, for example, um, you, we've got We've got a single resolution fund which uh, by 2024 will have something like 55 billion euro in funding which is contributed by, by the banks and with these different compartments there is a process of mutualization. It's quite a complex uh, uh, procedure the way it's working. However, uh, definitely in times of stress and in times when the roof would be really leaking, 55 billion is nothing much to go by, definitely. And uh, well, on th this roof is about to explode over here uh, at the moment, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to kindly stop you there. And just be, I know Michael is ready to come right up here, but what I would like to do briefly is just to, in one and a half minutes, um, just to summarise what has just happened and what it, what we've just heard. So Alfred started off by saying the kind of arrangement that we need to look at through the EU is important. Acceptance has crept in, and putting up barriers around London um, is is just useless because it's going to to remain a world-class financial center. Um, Huanita said that the view in London is to not wallow in the negativity of Brexit. Um, she mentioned that the feeling is the EU doesn't understand uh, the, the British position and that there was conversations around delegation back to London. She gave us the startling statistic around two-thirds of the financial services takes place outside of London and also that the key is for the, for the bodies there to sit on the ser service or standard setting areas. Um, David said that Malta should help Britain find its way. 
The EU doesn't, help, doesn't um, keep tabs on Brexit and that the EU is united behind Michel Barnier. The EU gives more weight to Dublin than to London. And then uh, Joseph said the angle is co-location. Until last November, we weren't sure if it was going to happen. And now London has lost up to uh, between 20 and 50,000 jobs. David then came back to say that Erasmus is one of the most successful programs that we've seen and that the view of Gozo and Malt in general is to look towards Africa, the Middle East, research and innovation. Hugh Anita then finished by saying that the banks should be allowed to fail. It's too early to see if resolution has been successful and we need to make banks focus on areas that they could be vulnerable before Alfred told us that we need to look at the holes before fixing the roof. Thank you very much indeed and uh, thank you indeed to every single one of my panellists and could you please give them a round of applause.